We'll start in, a, in a, about one minute. Great. Good afternoon. Welcome to MCIE's Spring Webinar Series on Transition Planning. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Barb Gruber from MCIE, and I will be your facilitator for this webinar. Um, I wanted to remind you of the second two webinars in the series, which are uh, next week, Customized Employment by Ellen Condon on the 23rd, and then on May 7th, Post-Secondary Education by Meg Griggle. Um, also during the session, you will be muted and you can type questions in the chat window. Uh, Mike will answer questions at the end of the session. The handout uh, for today's session will be available after the session through email. And the session will be recorded and will be available um, after today's session. Today's session is on the discovery process for employment planning with Michael Callahan. Uh, Mike has consulted throughout the US, Canada, and Europe in the area of employment and uh, transition for the past 30 years. He has worked with Mark Gold and Associates for 33 years and has served as president of the organization since Mark Gold's death in 1982. In 2000, Mike uh, joined three other colleagues to form a nonprofit organization, Employment for All. EFA is dedicated to assuring full access to employment for all persons with disability. He is a co-author of two popular how-to books on employment for persons with significant disabilities. Those are Getting Employed, Staying Employed, and Keys to the Workplace. He has written numerous articles, chapters, manuals, and curriculums pertaining to employment. It is my pleasure to turn the session over to you, Mike. Thanks, Barb, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session today. And uh, Barb, just in case, uh, I, uh, one more logistical issue. If uh, for some reason the uh, voice or the uh, my sound starts going down, just interrupt me uh, and also let me know uh, through the chat section, I'll look at that. So either way, just let me know. And uh, folks, we're going to talk about the concept of discovery as an alternative to comparative assessment procedures uh, for people in transition and for adults. And as we go through this, we'll start with, I'm on slide two, and I'll announce the slides uh, for anyone who uh, uh, might have a visual uh, disability. We'll just go to the next slide. One of, the, one of the best examples of the concept of discovery was uh, quoted by uh, a Nobel Prize winner, a guy named Georgi, who uh, was uh, notable for identifying vitamin C and in the mid-1930s won the Nobel Peace Prize for that. And, and he, uh, Dr. Georgi uh, said that discovery consists of looking at the same thing as everybody else and thinking something different. This is an important consideration because for most of the individuals that, that I'm talking about on this call, when they, when they are uh, exposed to or given or asked to uh, participate in a comparative evaluation, the results are almost always negative. And it's going to be necessary for us to look at people who have been looked at in so many negative deficit-based ways and really see something else. I'm on slide three, and this will be the only 
uh, capitalistic pitch that I have on this call. We have two resources that uh, those of you on the call might find interesting. They're certainly not necessary, but we have two rather inexpensive manuals available at markgold.com. We do take all credit cards. Thank you very much. And these manuals uh, would actually help you through uh, both understanding discovery more deeply and the profile, which is the narrative report, which is so necessary if we're going to ask systems to, to pay for the process. And for those of you who are teachers, so that what you know about a student gets accurately conveyed to the next teacher who may be a handoff down the, the line as students get older. Now on slide four. And I want to talk about people who are unlikely to be considered for employment. And um, and I, for myself personally, the, the story I want to tell you uh, is pretty close to home. I, I live in a small beach town on the coast of Mississippi. And uh, we have an otherwise outstanding school district. But for a lot of the, the kids with, with uh, development, intellectual and developmental disabilities, as a community, as a school district, uh, as a set of special ed teachers, and I think to some degree, parents also. We all, we all are uncertain as to what it means to have a significant intellectual disability and to be an adult in a way that is more like than unlike what, what we've done in the past of just moving to a waiting list, sitting around the house, or of course going to uh, a workshop or day program that's separate from others in the community. And Jenny is a is an example of a young woman that this happened to in our community. And her mother tells a very poignant tale of waking up one morning in the middle of the night, um, about 3 a.m., worried about what adult life was going to look like. And it, you know, once she realized she was awake, she realized she really had no idea. And uh, the ironic thing is that her daughter, Jenny, was 21, so she had taken full advantage of a free and I, you know, hopefully appropriate uh, public school education, but as a family and I think as a school and I think as a community, we had not come to terms with whether Jenny should be considered automatically a part of our of our the, the workforce in our community. And to make it to make it more complicated, because of a relationship we have with VR, she had been evaluated. And, and in comparison, had found that had performed in a way that she would not be expected to benefit in terms of a rehabilitation outcome. So, you know, what do you do? And the, I think the the interesting thing is is that our field has has become so confused about this, and it it really is pretty simple. You know, if we take the the prelog or a prologue to the Americans with Disabilities Act and also in the Rehab Act, uh, there's, a, there's a profound line that I think one day will be etched in stone in D.C. that we find that disability is a natural part of the human experience. And if that's the case, then why should Jenny be any, more, be any different than any of the other students uh, who are going to be graduating from our school? We need those kids to be the future of our communities we need Jenny to be the future of our communities. But our field gets confused about it. And one of the, one of the areas of confusion, I think, that we, that we do, and it, it had occurred to Jenny's mother, was to ask her if she wanted to work. And, uh, and if we had done that, and in fact her, because she had qualified for uh, our state's Medicaid waiver, one of our waivers, she had already been asked by a care manager, do you want to work, to which she thought the question was absurd and laughed and said, no, no. Um, and the, as we think about disability being a natural part of the human experience, we dare not ask our kids without disabilities if they want to work. I mean, what's the option? And it, it can't be good. So Jenny's mother kind of came to terms on behalf of her daughter. Instead of saying, Jenny, do you want to work? She finally came to terms with saying, Jenny, it's time to go to work. And remember, she had already failed an evaluation. So now we need an alternative. And that's where discovery comes in. Discovery provides a qualitative research alternative to the quantitative procedures 
uh, of comparative evaluations. Think maybe Margaret Mead instead of the Roper poll. You know that that gives you a pretty good idea. And um, and it can be a, this can be something accessible to parents, to teachers, and others who uh, maybe have not uh, prepared themselves for qualitative research. And one of the one of the sort of straightforward, I wouldn't say simple, but straightforward things that we get to know who the person is in discovery by spending time with them in places where they're at their best. So in a visit to Jenny's home with her family gathered around, Jenny has a very large family, seven siblings, mom and dad, a yours, mine, and our sort of family. Um, one of the things that we, that, that I asked was a real simple question of the whole family. Where is Jenny at her best? What is, think about her not in terms of her deficits, but in terms of her capability. What would you say the answer was? And nobody wanted to answer the question. Mom and dad had not thought of their daughter that way. The older siblings hadn't. But Jenny had a nine-year-old brother named Joey at the time. And, uh, and Joey raised his hand, I don't know, nine-year-olds are smart mouth, who knows, but he suggested that she opened Christmas presents better than anybody in the family. So you got a family of 10 people, that's a, that's a compliment, even from a nine-year-old. And at, on the face of it, it's not much. But in reality, if we can, if we can get to know Jenny and, and get a sense of all those discrete skills that she can do, and then do something that we're often that we we just overlook. I think it's just so simple we overlook it. And that is, if she can open a Christmas present, how could we translate that into a business task? If she can open a Christmas present, she could receive a box at a company. And then, if you have a concept of customized employment, which is a kindred spirit to the, the issue of discovery, then what you need to do is find an employer who would benefit from having boxes open, and you're already on a path to helping Jenny become employed. And I'll go to slide five, and that's what we did. I mean, we started thinking about our community in terms of where do people open boxes. I mean, but please understand, that wasn't the only task. Discovery is this look into the individual's life so that we have an array of tasks that we can then consider in relation to employer need and benefit. And, and if we get people to help us, you know, there are employers, there are families who know where people open boxes. It's, it's pretty simple. We ended up at one such place, which turned out to be a logistics place in our community, talked to the employer, and he immediately got it. And in fact, he took us to a machine and showed us a, a operator operating a computer-assisted embroidery machine who was multitasking at a factor of about five or six. In other words, she had five or six things that she was doing almost simultaneously at any one time. And we weren't really seeing Jenny in this machine, but the, the employer knew what the benefit would be. So when, when the last, it was a machine that embroidered the logo of the U.S. Navy on the front of, of a baseball cap. It turned out to be, who knew it in our little community, the place where baseball caps are made for sailors. I mean, sailors, I guess, only wear the old white sailor cap uh, in formal situations, and they make baseball caps all the rest of the time. This is the machine that makes the caps for the Navy. And so as the, the caps were going through the machine, a robotic arm would pick a cap up, a robotic computer-assisted needle would embroider the cap, the worker would do all of her work, and then at one point, the, the supply line ran out of caps. And it was at this point, the employer targeted our attention to the need to have boxes open to keep the machine running. And he, he asked us, do you think this young woman that you're talking about could open the cap, open the boxes and prepare the caps? And the answer was, it's the same thing she does that the toughest evaluator in the world, your nine-year-old brother, said she could do. And she worked there for a year and a half. Um, not forever, but for a year and a half. And uh, why not? Well, the gentleman who hired her had a heart attack, almost died. His son takes over and lays off half the workers at the workplace, and Jenny is now a laid-off worker. 
So now we need to do it again. But the concept has been verified. Here's Jenny working for 20 to 25 hours a week at about a dollar an hour over minimum wage. And she's now a working woman in our community, more like than dislike other people in town. And then we found another situation at our local gas company. We have a, we have a gas company in our small town that, that does regional distribution of propane and natural gas throughout the Gulf South. And, and she has been there since late 2000. And it's 2013, so you do the math. Right at 13 years, she still goes to work every day. Now, her disability has actually gotten more significant. Jenny's disability pedigree is pretty significant. She has very significant intellectual disability. She has one side of her body that doesn't work for her. And she can have up to three grand mal seizures a week and about 40 or so petty mal seizures every day where she spaces out for a period of time and has to come back to awareness. Her employer has accommodated that for all these years. She now has to wear a helmet because unfortunately she's lost her aura and that's tough. But I mean, it, for me, Jenny represents that whole host of people that not only are perceived not to be employable, but would say, I don't want to work. And I think both perspectives are wrong. Uh, a, we shouldn't be comparing people against others to determine if they can work, and B, we ought to just be expecting people to go to work. Now, please understand, I'm not saying force people to go to work. That's, that's a whole different issue. But imagine how different it would be if all of our transition to work programs in school were dedicated to A, the presumption that all students can work, period, and B, every student's going to leave school with a transition job. It would really make special education be worthwhile, I think. I'm going now to slide seven. So as we're thinking about all of that, what's the process? We need to look, kind of using the Webster's definition, we need to find insider knowledge of something that's not seen or known, which is kind of back to Dr. Georgi's perspective about this. We look at people and we need to see something new and different. We need to bring it out and use it. So now I'm going to slide eight. The problem is most people have kind of the tip of the iceberg as their public persona, and student, including most students in transition years. They come to school acting as students. Now I know some of you are thinking sometimes students act in ways that may not be exactly like a student, but the point is, there's so much more behind the scenes. There's so much more of their life beyond school. And often school isn't where students with significant intellectual and developmental disabilities are at their best. Now that's unfortunate, but it's simply not. But even if it is, then we need to be paying attention to what are all of those skills performed at school and how can we translate them to employment possibility. And then for students who aren't at their best at school, we need to be in those aspects of their life. Again, the qualitative researcher, the anthropologist, the ethnographer, getting into people's lives, getting to see where people are at their best, and then boldly translating what you see into possibility. That, that's the secret, that's the essence of good discovery. I'll go now to slide nine. Since we're doing all of this, one of the things we have to, to get at is what are, once we're taking this look, we're, we're getting beyond the, the bounds of our classrooms and even our schools. We're, we're seeing the whole community, where the student lives, their home, their neighborhood, all of the places in their community, including their school, including their church, including sports and recreation, all the places that, that young people and adults, I, I'm kind of focusing on transition here, but Everything I'm saying applies to adults similarly. We're looking at all of that, but we've got to distill a great deal of information. One of the things that can happen in discovery is you can just, you can get so much stuff, it almost becomes overwhelming. And what we want to, we're, we're going to get at strengths, needs, and interests by asking the question, who is this person? 
and this is consistent with the U.S. Department of Labor's definition for customized employment, because that's going to be important. And what discovery actually provides is a lens, a lens so that we can find direction for either a customized wage job, in other words, where somebody goes to work and gets paid an hourly rate, or even running their own business. So both customized wage employment and customized self-employment become the, the opportunity for us to, to have these uh, options. So for obviously for educators and for families, the period of transition has got to include the opportunity for the kinds of, of experiential situations so we can see students doing things at their best and begin to translate all during the educational process. I'm going to slide 11 now. As I said before, we, we need to get essential from all the information we find. And here are the three, if you will, legs of the stool that discovery stands on, or maybe sits on if you'd like. First is conditions for success. Another is interest toward a certain aspect of the labor market. And then potential contributions to employers. Now each of these operates differently. Every one of us has conditions for success. We know that we are, we are better in some situations than others. Like for me personally, I'm not so good in heavy traffic when I'm late. But I'm pretty good if I'm on a boat on the water. So given conditions, those two conditions, I would be better off in the second one than the first one. Uh, but others, I mean, there's all kinds of conditions. It's whether we sit or stand, or whether we work during the day early or late in the afternoon or in the evening, or whether we are up to a long commute to work or whether we need to be so close to work we could almost walk. All of us have a set of conditions that, that would make work more likely. In competitive employment, employers basically ask employees to suck it up. You know, if I'm sorry you have to drive 30 minutes to work, Mr. Callahan, but that's where work is, that's where you live, so you better do it. In customized employment, if someone doesn't need to travel 30 minutes to work, we don't look for a job 30 minutes away. We customize at least as best we can from the perspective of conditions. Interests are very tough to get at. I mean, they're, in a sense, they're so easy. If you want to know what somebody wants to do, just ask them. Well, it is about the, the, the most... Uh, inaccurate way to solve the issue. Uh, you know, not only is talk cheap, but our dreams are such that students either don't know what the answer to the question and kind of leave us wondering, or uh, they shoot for the top, you know, and you, you say, what would you like to do? Well, I'd like to be a professional ice skater. Well, you spend the next two months talking them out of their vocational goal because there's no way we can make that happen in reality. So in, in looking at interest, instead of asking people what they want to do, ask people what they do. And then hopefully they have enough richness in their life to where that we can follow whatever it is they do, actually on their own volition do, and, and see if there's a lead there for employment. This is based on the concept, I'm sure Mark Gold wasn't the first to articulate this, but he he actually, excuse me, I touched the touchpad. Uh, he talked about a concept called intrinsic interest, uh, meaning a concept that it's something we do when we're not expected to do it. Whatever the answer to that is, that's our intrinsic interest. And if we could find the two or three or four directions of, intent, of, of intrinsic interest that each individual has, we've got something far better than someone saying, I want to be a police officer, I want to be an astronaut, I want to be a rock star. I mean, what do we do with those things? Uh, and we know people rarely say, I want to be a janitor at the entry level of the service industry. So they're, they're not shooting low, they tend to shoot high. Interest gets us away from that and actually lets us truly pursue opportunities for students. And then the last is, is what, is they, what are they going to offer? 
and the contributions they have to offer are often subtle. They're embedded in in activities of life that we overlook. And if we can look closely, if we can hone our skills to look closely at skills of life, we can then translate those into business language, as we did with Jenny, translating opening a Christmas present to receiving a box at a uh, or opening a box in a company, as she did. So think about these three components of discovery as being the foundation components. Now I'm on slide, well, the next slide I've lost. It looks like slide 12 on my uh, counter, but I don't see a number on this particular slide. For almost everything we learn in discovery, we need to translate it to the perspective of a workplace. Now, this is presupposing that discovery is being used to guide employment. Now, if you were guiding, let's say, community activities, or even if you were guiding school inclusion activities, then discovery would, the translation part, would need to relate to whatever it is that discovery is being used to provide the foundation of planning for, excuse my syntax. Um, and But all through this presentation, we'll be talking about employment. So we'll be translating to employment and workplace possibilities. And obviously, we need to be bold. We need to be, it, no employer is going to be impressed by our constant focus on deficits. They're just not. So if we're not willing to be bold and to be optimistic, then people are going to remain unemployed. It's as simple as that. Okay, I'm going to slide 13. A metaphor for discovery is that we're all pretty much like pieces of a very complex jigsaw puzzle. And one of the things I, I think about this is that no one person, no parent, no sibling, no neighbor, no teacher, no bus driver, no professional counselor has all the pieces. We all, have, we all have individual pieces. Friends have different pieces than siblings. Neighbors have different people with different pieces than teachers. In person-centered planning, we often just go out and look to find the people who have the puzzle pieces and bring them to a meeting, hoping somehow they'll all come together. And discovery is a very intentional activity, finding the people actually having interviews with them as necessary, asking people to think optimistically, hopefully, around the issue of employment. And then, slide 14, to pull all of that together in a cogent picture. Now, we do this in a profile document, which is a descriptive document of the individual that provides the foundation for the planning that will follow. And again, it, the planning could be in different directions. We're talking about a customized plan for employment here. This document is extremely important. It contains the information, so now all of us reading the document now know all of the person's story. I know now the puzzle pieces someone else has. They now know the pieces I have, so we've got a more complete picture of these very complex individuals that we're talking about. Discovery is distinct from traditional comparative assessment. And I'll go very quickly through some of the, the ways in which this happens. Discovery uses, you can, any time in your life that you did something, it's something you own. You don't have to do it just right there in that moment of performance. If you're doing something well in one environment, we can translate to another and I think accurately and optimistically presume the person should be able to do it at work if they can do it in life. I'm now going to slide 16. We have a different kind of validity. We get an ecological validity relates to how well do we actually know this individual and what goes on in their life rather than just looking at small units of performance and predicting often the fact that the person can't do very well. We have, if you've got great ecological validity, you'll actually have some good predictive validity, but it's not based on comparison. Another thing about discovery is you can't fail it. You start with an A, you end with an A. 
So you may not, you must not use it to ever exclude anybody from employment. It's impossible. You can't fail discovery. Believe me, you can fail a comparative evaluation. Go to slide 17. And getting at the complexities in a person's life, that we really understand what kind of work conditions need to be in place so complexities are minimized. See, this discovery doesn't in any way um, avoid the notion that people have significant disabilities. Of course they do. It's right in front of all of us. But almost all those complexities can be dealt with if we can get the conditions right, if we can follow their interest, and then offer unique contributions to employers. So we can really get at how to think about that. And the, one of the last distinctions is that discovery involves all the people that are important to the individual. Whereas any of you that have ever had a student or a child go to an evaluation, you realize you leave them at the door, you come back and pick them up at the end. You have no idea. Now, people aren't abused in evaluation, so I'm not worried about people getting hurt. What I'm worried about is people being excluded, you know? And, and we want to be right there. We want the baby crawling under the table. We want grandma there on the sofa. We want all the people who matter available during the whole process of discovery. Look at slide 18. And just reflect a little bit. So discovery is a process that involves getting to know people and helping them get to know themselves. Although I'll say, I'll say reflection is kind of a icing on the cake. It's not my primary focus of discovery. This is something we do uh, on behalf of individuals. Time is the essential ingredient. If we're not willing to spend time with people in their lives, not in our lives, not in our, just our classrooms, not just in the programs we have, but in their lives, we won't know them. Discovery is the best way to find the best that people have to offer. And it offers a common sense strategy to get at complexities and preferences and interests. So I'm going to slide 19. It also lets us see these contributions that we can get at through translation. And just think of this next bullet because it's so important. Discovery is enhanced when we get to know people in places where they are most who they are, where they're at their best. If each of us asked that question as we were thinking about whether they were students in transition or adults we were working with, where are you at your best? If I can see you there, the translation is going to be of the maximum use. It's also important to understand that discovery itself is not a plan. And it is very important during discovery not to engage in possibilities until you plan. And one of the reasons is, as a reality, discovery begins shutting down when we start planning for what's next. And if, if on the first day of, of discovery you see something interesting and you talk to a family or a student about it, they want you to stop and, okay, let's go. We've got our direction now. And we don't. We need to know way more. But because it's about the person, it's extremely compatible with self-determination and choice. So we're, we honor self-determination and choice, but we also honor it by not asking the question, do you want to work, but by saying, it's time to go to work. Then if the person can figure out how to say, I don't want to go, then we honor it. But, that's, but I, want to be, I want to be very hard of hearing when somebody tries to say, I don't want to work, because that's going to be a tough life for them uh, for a long, long time. I'm going to slide 20. And one of the things in order to get the best, we have to cast a pretty broad net over life. So within discovery, you're really taking that opportunity to get at as many nooks and crannies of life, hoping to find competence, hoping to find conditions for success, hoping to find interest. And not all areas will yield the same catch, but we have to cast that net broadly. Uh, here we owe Lou Brown a great debt because he suggested these domains of life probably 30 years ago, uh, almost 40 now, 35 years ago, just after 94-142 was passed. And Discovery stands on those shoulders of the work that Lou Brown and his colleagues did 
in these domains of life and then applying them to this concept of understanding our students and adults with significant intellectual and developmental disabilities. So I'm going to slide 21. We can facilitate discovery, and that's really what I'm talking about here. This is done as a service either during school or doing a, during adulthood. But we're also learning that if we can bring some, for some people it's very uh, appropriate and maybe even more successful to have a small group experience of discovery. But the important thing is the group is about who I am for each person. And then the group influence will help people understand and reflect more easily of who they are. This is growing in importance. And in fact, uh, TASH is doing a, a federal project right now where we're looking at group discovery within the one-stop system, the workforce system in the country, and very excited about uh, what we will find as we do that. Slide 23. As we're looking at facts, this isn't a terribly onerous thing. Now, these, these discovery data that I'm about to give you here are about primarily for adults. It will be longer in school simply because you have more time available. You have the luxury of the natural unfolding of maturation during school. But for adulthood, we find that about 20 hours or so, with a range of about 16 to 24 hours, over a period of time of three to six weeks, with an average of four weeks, is sufficient to get the information you need to go to a plan and then to develop the profile that comes from this. And, um, and actually, that, that is very compatible with what we pay and the time investment for comparative assessment, although it's done much more in a condensed way, comparative assessment is, the actual hours are, are about the same and the cost can be the same. Don't let anybody tell you that discovery takes too long and is too expensive. And also, if at first at least, we recommend having a small team, but we mean a small team. And this can be very multidisciplinary, if you will. Teachers can join with parents. Uh, we can welcome adult service people. There's all kinds of people that can join us on a non a, you know, non-certified personnel, uh, paraprofessionals can do discovery. A small team is best, uh, but with a leader. So just think about some of that. Let's go to slide 24. What I want to do is talk to you about, real quickly, a, a discovery story and introduce a young man, uh, or young at the time, Andy was actually 14 when this picture was taken, uh, from Long Island in the state of New York. And, and so here you have a student with virtually his whole life in front of him. You've got to love him because he loves dogs. Uh, and beyond that, as you see in this picture, he, uh, uh, his family had chosen to be a host family for, a ser for service dogs and to have Andy assisted with his cerebral palsy with a service dog. So for me, it was a first. I'd worked with plenty of people with CP, but I'd never worked with someone who used a service dog for uh, for support, and so I was going to learn a lot. So this is this is a picture at 14. Let me show you a picture at 18. Four years later, Andy comes home from school. His mom goes through his backpack. She pulls this picture out of his backpack, and she changes from the most supported and supportive parent you could have to a mother from hell. She is now wondering, what are you thinking? If you're thinking that an 18-year-old young man ought to be doing coloring, showing a gorilla putting a banana peel in a wastebasket, shame on us. I mean, I, the only good thing for me is I say, thank God it's not from Mississippi. But beyond that, I mean, the parent, all automatically, like if you think this, you can't think that my son in three years is going to go into a job. Well, what this did for the family was it, it, they wanted a different view of their son. Unfortunately, they ended up getting a different view, and that is they sent him to an evaluation that the school paid for. And the results were pretty tough. Slide 26 and 27 are, are verbatim excerpts from his evaluation. Almost everything you see here is negative. Look, production rate, 6%. Uh, Percentile rate, first percent, that's not best, that's the lowest. 
uh, one, reading comprehensive, 1.6 grade level. In other words, Andy, being compared to others, is doing very poorly. And then on this next page, on slide 27, read the second paragraph. The second, yeah, the whole paragraph. Here's where the other shoe drops. See, the system uses poor performance as an excuse to have 18-year-olds coloring pictures and the fact that he's not going to go to work. Okay, So here, due to Mr. Cosell's very low level of productivity and his need for constant supervision, traditional employment is not feasible. Now, those of you who are horrified because I'm using Andy's last name, I have full permission. He wants his story told first and last name, Andrew Cosell. So, you know, as, as you see this, this is the system Instead of embracing the likelihood of employment, they're trying to make the case based on comparison that he can't. So I got pulled into all of this uh, gladly, but it's not what I do as a consultant. And I offered to do discovery. And one of the things that did, it put me in Andy's house. And when I went to his house, one of the first things I saw was this picture. And I was looking at it. His mom had just taken my bags into the guest room, and she came out. She said, strong impressionistic overtones, don't you think? Now, there's two things you need to know. One, uh, I had art appreciation at the University of Southern Mississippi in the Stone Age. So I'm way over my head in the state of New York. And um, so that doesn't work. Two, this picture was painted by Andrew less than a week after he after he did the, the coloring. So, I mean, it's a, it's a perfect example of Mark Gold's chameleon phenomenon. People will be who we expect them to be. They'll change their coloration. Andy can be a person operating as a four-year-old, if you want him to do that. He can do adult art. And, I, and that's a point. I'm not saying this is great art, good art, you know, or even impressionistic art. I'm just saying it's adult art. It's putting a paint to canvas is what Andrew should be doing. So I'm already on a roll, and one of the things I find on slide 29 is an ind indication this guy can ski. Now, folks, Andy has spastic cerebral palsy. It affects his ambulation, his manipulation, and his communication. He has an intellectual disability in the significant range of intellectual disability, and he can ski. Folks, as a southerner who learned to ski in middle age, I can tell you if you can ski, you can work. Period. Done deal. You don't have, I mean, what else do we need? Of course he can work. There's, I mean, it's, it's an activity of unbelievable complexity. And here he's using outriggers and somehow figuring out how to stay up. And, and here, just in two things that represent Andy's life in his home, we already see a completely different picture than was painted literally and figuratively, by the system. Going to slide 30. And as I spent time with him, I saw he had musical interest. I saw he had a computer, which was, by the way, state of the art in 1990 is when all this was, was done. So we're back now, what, 23 years ago. And all the, all the small tasks that I saw him doing, from loading cassettes to playing games on the computers, all of those were translated into work skills going to slide 20, uh, 31. Uh, here's Andy at his birthday party, which, which I attended. Look here, he's opening a Christmas present. So if, if Jenny, in fact, we learned from Jenny actually here, if Jenny could open a Christmas present, she can open boxes, but we learned it from Andy. If he can open a birthday present, he can open boxes. He's showing you skills right here. He's talking to his, his uh, cousin who he has a conversation with. He's showing you communication skills. All we have to do is see them as positive. Slide 32, what about all the stuff that Charger does? I mean, he's a support. At Andy's evaluation, Charger was made to lay down at the front door all day, and a good service dog he was. He waited patiently and faithfully for Andy. And they never used anything Charger could do for support as part of the evaluation. Why not? It's his life. He's chosen to, to have a relationship with a support dog, why not use the dog for support? I don't know, because it wasn't in their protocol. Slide 33. Finally, uh, by the way, the, the school and the family go to, go to court on a fair hearing. The school's got the, got the uh, 
the evaluation and the family has the profile of discovery. The judge looks at each and rules for the family by saying, I actually see Andrew in this document. I don't see him in the comparative document. And the school, he got to go from a BOCE school in New York to a regular high school, special ed class, self-contained. This was, you know, 20 years ago. And the school actually got him a work experience. This at a local uh, family-owned department store. And skills were learned, and it, the, the work experience provided an additional lens for discovery. And in 92, Andy graduated from school, and his parents and teacher went out into the community late in for a second uh, work experience at the State University of New York Training Hospital at Stony Brook. And um, in August of 92, after the work experience was over, Andy started his first job there. So I'm going to slide 33. And th all of the information was based on discovery. Now on slide 35. So Andy was responsible for delivering data information to 82 departments within the hospital. Now his mother could have told you he's got a memory like an elephant. But the evaluation didn't show it. You see where I'm going with that? So we value, and his mother wasn't just giving him competence. He, he had it, and he did it, okay? So he's been there now for uh, this summer will be his 21st uh, anniversary working at the hospital. He's still working 20 years, 20 plus years later. Let me give you some information about Andy. Andy works 35 hours a week. He makes 24.50 an hour. He is a member of the um, union that organizes the transport workers at SUNY Stony Brook, and he is a home owner on Long Island. In other words, he's got a life. I have no idea what his 401k looks like. And by the way, he's still painting, uh, which is pretty nice. In other words, here on slide 37, he's got a, uh, you know, a recreational life. He volunteers. He's volunteered at the Long Island's veterans home, talking to the old guys who live there, and he goes to work every day. A true working life from someone who was not supposed to be able to work at all based on our predictive instruments. As we're doing discovery, I'm on slide 38 now. Um, we use the tools of the, facilit of, the, of the qualitative researcher. These are interview and conversation, observation, time together, participation. When, it, when we're close to the end, we review existing information and then we organize it into a profile. These are tools that are professional research tools. They're texts, college texts developed for qualitative research. Discovery is a form of that. It is a bona fide professional uh, endeavor that we can, we can at the same time do almost immediately and then spend a lifetime preparing and bettering ourselves to, to hone our skills. It is, it is just fascinating in that sense. Going to uh, the next slide, I just covered this, so beyond 39. Let me get at, the, at some of the issues of discovery and then do a quick potpourri as we wrap up. Uh, the who of discovery starts with the individual at the core and goes out to family and loved ones, close and trusted friends, neighbors with good relationships, and to all professionals who have a positive and optimistic look. If anybody on this list is negative, avoid them. Now, I know it gets tough when you get closer to the person. You know, if, if mom is yay and dad is nay, You've got to deal with that. But as soon as you get out of the family, out of the immediate family, then just avoid the naysayers and really focus on people who are optimistic. You don't get jobs by submitting a negative resume. You just don't. The how of discovery is, again, the qualitative perspective. Interview and conversations only account for about 25% of discovery but ob uh, and conversation. Observations, however, account for as much as 40 percent. 
people don't have to talk in order to do discovery. They don't have to be able to answer questions. It's fine if they have a communication system or if they don't because most of discovery isn't about just asking people questions. And we want to actually participate in their lives up to 25%. Then right at the end, we do two activities that serve kind of as a crystal ball. We, ask, we look at people where they're at their absolute best, thinking that's a pretty good example of how much support they're going to need if they're on the job six months or a year. And we also ask them to participate in a novel activity, something they've never done, because that's going to look a lot like the first day of work. Those are very important activities of discovery. And we wrap up by reviewing the records. Now, I realize in most permanent records are not full of good information, but here you, you should be inoculated by now for anything negative that you see. Slide 42, the where, operates much like the who. We start at home and we go out from there. School is only an aspect of discovery. It is an aspect, but only one of all the neighborhood, community, peer groups, church, everywhere people are, most who they are. That's where in the community. And finally, the what is we talked about earlier. It's the kind of what Lou Brown offered to all of this, and that's the domains of life. We look at all life domains to try to find information for moving forward. Now let's just spend the last few minutes we've got reflecting and uh, I'll come over at five till the hour. I've got about seven minutes to go through this list. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm not seeing many so far, so begin to think about any questions. But let's just reflect a bit on discovery. So I'm going to slide 45. Here's a young student with autism who had had four jobs in the community. He quit every one of the jobs. He wasn't fired from any, he quit every one. He doesn't, James doesn't tell you, well, here's, let me reflect with you why I quit. He just leaves. He walks, you know, boats with his feet. Um, we did discovery, found that he spent most of his time watching cop shows, those awful rough them, stuff them, and cuff them live action reality cop shows. And, um, and we found we had never followed his interest at all. But when we ended up at our local sheriff's department, James has been working there now for 14 years. What you see in front of him that he's organizing are misdemeanor arrest reports and traffic citations. The reason he's doing them, because they were in boxes, unfiled, and waiting for someone to get to them. And for the sheriff, it was a, it was a big plus to have him there. So as you begin to think about it, here's a, here's a young woman that during discovery, we had to ask her mother when she was present. Her disability is so significant that Marcy did not um, indicate her emotion through facial expression. So we had mom was the primary person that helped us, but her teacher gave us the lead on helping her with a switch technology. And here you see a work task personal assistant helping her with her task. So when you look at this picture, I want you to think of Marcy as Stephen Hawking and Doris in the blue as the guy who puts the paper in Stephen Hawking's printer. And you have a pretty good idea of the justification for having a work task personal assistant. Marcy does the staple, Doris holds the paper, for which for 13 years she got paid a dollar an hour more than the supporters who helped her. She always made a minimum of a dollar an hour more. I'm speaking in the past tense, Marcy died three weeks ago on a Monday after going to work on a Friday. So she had a full working life. Slide uh, 47, we found Larry had a secret as a, a guy in a workshop that he wouldn't tell anybody that a mailman had actually taught him basic reading and number sequencing by sitting down on the front stoop every day uh, after he got out of the sheltered workshop. And he wouldn't even tell anybody about it because he was afraid we would tell him he couldn't do post office work. Well, the U.S. Post Office wouldn't hire him because they're just difficult people. But hey, mailboxes, et cetera, did. And in fact, the boss, the owner of the mailboxes, et cetera, was interested in talking to Larry because he got treated by the post office the same way Larry got treated. So he, he said he, uh, he was going to uh, 
to compete against, if you'll excuse my language, the SOBs, and started his own business. So he was very interested in having Larry uh, interview Larry and to see what Larry could offer uh, at the mailboxes, et cetera. Wonderful way to connect people based on shared interest. Two brothers that, um, that did data entry for a, um, a, a company in New Orleans and each had their own unique conditions. The brother on the left needed to, to be home by one, and the one on the right needed to not start until about 12.30. And, uh, and sometimes they're rather frivolous. On the, uh, Glenn on the left uh, needed to be home for soap operas, and he, he had sat at home for, for seven years waiting for somebody to get him a job in the morning. And uh, Otto on the right stays up all night, so we just, negotiated through uh, customized employment to have their time spent. They had 30 minutes together to share some work uh, as one brother hands off to the other. Uh, Catherine in slide 49 liked to do hospitality of just serving people coffee. She doesn't even drink coffee. So we helped her start a coffee cart at a community college uh, that had been selling uh, the vending machine coffee and the students rebelled by gumming up the vending machine. The coffee was so awful and scalded. So imagine the business that Catherine had in her uh, coffee kiosk at the community college. And a, a, a guy uh, whose family had all been woodworkers and we found, a, uh, we found a cabinet maker who was spending most of his time going back and forth to his toolbox in an incubator in Pittsburgh, an old steel mill. And uh, so Robert comes in to provide him tool assistance, but then the guy started teaching him craft, and so now each of them actually needs a, a tool assistant. But uh, that's a good problem to have. And Anna, I, I'll, I'm actually going to stop with Anna's story. Uh, people all the time talk about people being too old to go to work. Anna was, was one of the Olmstead targeted people in the state of Illinois. She got out of a nursing home when she was 78 years old. And instead of saying she wanted to retire, <laughs> she said, I, I've been in a nursing home all my life. I want to go to work. And uh, in discovery, the facilitator found that Anna walked around the nursing home with a brownie camera, a Kodak brownie around her neck, and she had hundreds and hundreds of photographs. So Melinda looked at the photographs and found that every one of Anna's pictures were perfectly centered. So translate that when you find the, the legal industry at that time in the late 90s was digitizing almost all of their paper files and by scanning. They were using these companies that did an awful job. Many times the, the documents were twisted on the page and important information was left out. Well, think of the skill that Anna already has, we can tell by her pictures. So she scanned, uh, started work at a, at a law office when she was uh, 78 years old, and she worked until she was 84 when she died. And uh, she was still working, and she didn't die on the job, but she was working when she died. So customized employment can be pretty powerful in that sense. So, Barb, I think I'm right at 3.55. We've got about five minutes. Do you have any questions that have come up that I need to answer before we, we wrap up today? I don't see any. Does anyone have anything? You can type it in the chat box. Or I could unmute if, uh, and see what happens. Um, how about if we try that? I'll just open the line. These are unmuted. So, oh, all of you out there who are now unmuted, uh, if you're on a mobile, there are a couple of problems here, but some of you now are unmuted. Any questions, just speak up. Hello there, this is Francesca Pellegrino from the Catholic Coalition for Special Education. I was wondering if Mark Golden Associates uh, operates uh, nationally. Yes, thank, and thank you. Thank you for your presentation, by the way. It was uh, very insightful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And yes, we, uh, we do operate nationally. 
uh, we're a consulting organization. Our primary role is training and technical assistance. And I, I just want to make it clear, I did in a story I was telling, we don't come in and do discovery. We teach people how to do it and provide technical assistance, and we do it across the country. So every state, uh, provinces in Canada, and occasionally uh, in Western Europe. So yes, absolutely, and we'd love to, love to come your way if you, if you needed some help. You can get in touch with us. Our phone number is on each of the slides that you'll be getting from Barb. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and I see there's a question about the slides uh, being available, and yes, they will be available um, probably by tomorrow afternoon, and I'll email them out to all the participants. Yeah, and Barb, let me make a, a request. As you get these, you're dealing with a lot of imagery, uh, and uh, I would like you may share them in your organization for training and to others, but please do not post this online for long-term public use because again, there's I want to minimize just the the confidentiality. We have we have permission to use all of these, but but you know try to keep them in house. I would really appreciate that. Thank you. Barb, it sounds like okay. that's it. It does. So I just want to thank you, Mike, for a great presentation. Um, I, I'm inspired. Um, and I want to thank the participants. Um, and we hope we'll see some of you at the uh, next one, Ellen Condon, next Tuesday. Um, yeah, we'll Ellen is a, is a colleague, Barb, excuse me, and it's going to be a great presentation and will be very in keeping with what I just talked about. Great. Well, if there aren't any more questions, uh, I'm going to thank you again, Mike, and um, I'm going to turn this thing off. Hey, thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you.